Hello and welcome to Happy Horror Time Podcast. I'm Tim Murdoch. And I'm Matt Emmer. And I cannot tell you how excited we are about today's special guest as she is the star and final girl of my favorite Friday the 13th sequel. And I've even made that known in earlier episodes. Part 7, The New Blood. That's right. She played the fierce and fabulous Tina Shepard, who used her telekinetic powers to break the hockey mask right off Jason Voorhees face. And after surviving this installment, she reprised her iconic character just last year, 33 years after Part 7 came out in Roseblood, a Friday the 13th fan film. Please welcome to the podcast, the one, the only, Laura Park Lincoln. Woo! Hi, you guys. That was... That was a really fun um, inter- uh, introduction. That was a really fun introduction. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, we are so excited to have you here. You know, like we yes. we have a ton of fun questions for you, but like we always like taking it back to the beginning. And so you were born in Dallas, right? I was born in Fort Worth. Oh, oh, oh okay. Connected to Dallas by a freeway. Oh, <laughs> okay. Exactly. So we were just wondering, like, how did you first get involved in acting? Had you always wanted to be in show business? By my third grade, I knew um, my dad was an army colonel. So I was an, I'm an army brat. So we traveled to all of the bases and there's not a lot of film and modeling opportunity on the military bases. You know, they wear <laughs> one thing. And uh, I knew that I wanted to get into the business and I, I didn't know how I was going to do it. And I just kept kind of studying all my young, young years. And then when I hit about 12, 13, I started modeling, training, doing the whole process until, um, well, it took 10 years to get my SAG card, my union card. Oh, and wow. Wow. Big role, which is pretty common, actually, for most yeah. actors. I got mine the, the old fashioned way. There was a strike and they said, if you strike this commercial, you can get it. No, that was back in 2000. Anyway, I do not have a I do not have not do that. Yeah, I, I booked a, a commercial for back to school clothing, and they said if you don't do the commercial, we'll make you a member of SAG because that's how serious they were. Wow, I have never heard that. It, yeah. I've never heard that. But, you know, I have a, a stu- acting studio, and I'm gonna tell my students that wait for a strike <laughs> yeah, t- tips from tim tim you're going to be the special guest in lars next That's class right i've got two cents i hope they you know listen <laughs> well, that my two cents you know we're good some country um, oh go ahead Matt. no 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 no. you go, go oh i was gonna ask you um so growing up was were horror films on your radar was there anything that made an impact on you like Sh- uh, jaws sharks oh Ooh, okay that's a that- good one that did it for me about age 12 jaws never gotten over it ever never gotten over it um and my mother introduced me to hitchcock and of course you know rear window and and all of those and uh, my sister introduced me to a show with karen black it was called trilogy of terror yes oh Oh my god i love that I, i think that's my favorite of all time it's great. That's a good one. Oh, uh, you're speaking Tim's language. No, yes. Jaws. I mean, I think Jaws is one of your favorite. Oh my god, I love all. Yeah. I love all Jaws one, two, three, and four. It really yeah, has made know, an impact though on people's lives. It, well, it did. I mean, that thing is a mean looking shark, you know. And and I love the ocean. The ocean's just my place. And I'll get in and I play, but once in a while it'll go through my mind. You know, where's where's that shark? But there was a really fun uh, alligator scary movie out recently. Called Crawl. So oh, yes. Cool. yes, 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 yes. We That's know a great it. movie. So I saw it on the airplane flying uh, out of L.A. And I'm like, ah, ah. <laughs> and my student next to me is just like, Ms. Laura, I'm like, the alligator is getting everyone. And did you know, fun fact, uh, when you're on an airplane, you're much more vulnerable and you cry more on airplanes. Wait, wow. what? OK, I want to see this study. It's true. <laughs> you're wanna... much more likely to cry on an airplane because you're you're up in the air. You can't go anywhere. I, I can see that. But I would think that you, I would feel safer from an alligator in an airplane than I would like if I no, was watching I'll, that. There was probably an alligator on the plane. I can't. Hey, know. have you seen snakes on a plane? Have, yes, have I you, have. Have you, Lar? Um, Well, I shot a film called Sky Sharks 
<gasps> in Germany a few years ago, and it came out this last um, last uh, quarter of last year. Sky Sharks. Oh my! How did we not know yes, that? We we, we try to do a lot of research and watch all the stuff. And I, yeah. Oh my gosh! Now we're gonna have to. Where can we find it? <laughs> oh gosh! I, well, I don't know. I got my. I just got my copy off of you know Amazon or something. Mm-hmm. It's streaming, and uh, these guys called. They were in Germany, and we were going over. All of us were going over for appearances, and there's a ton of us actors that have been in every imaginable show and so what they started doing was putting putting us in different places in the film you know all of us little easter eggs everywhere and i I looked up their stuff to see what they had done before and i really liked it their special effects were amazing really amazing i'm like that'd be the most fun thing ever and it was i was a flight attendant and the plane starts to go crazy and yeah it was really fun (laughs) i want to see it that's amazing you know Oh, and so you also, in addition to, um, uh, what was I saying? Before Friday. (laughs) Yes, you also did the Knott's Landing. Can you tell us about your soap experience and what storyline was just like bonkers that you remember? Yeah, what's the craziest storyline? Because I'm a huge soap fan. Well, Knott's Landing was, uh, is, and is a dream. It was a dream of a lifetime. It was a dream to do. The character of Linda Fairgate was absolutely ridiculous and fabulous and um you know she just caused trouble everywhere she went in a very sly way which I loved and I loved her I came on uh just doing a two episode role and it ended up turning into a five-year character wow and um I bet you don't know that I played two characters on not I have two two credits for two different characters. I did not know that. No, were they related or totally separate? No, totally separate. So what had happened is the storyline with my husband had had played out and um, I had a contract with them and they said, well, we have a role for you. We're not sure what it's going to be exactly, but show up. And I'm like, show up. So I did. And I was playing a mystery woman on a phone for entire season for eight episodes as a as a mystery woman with Ted Shackelford for him to fall in love with this mystery woman. So you don't see my face or head, you just see my body talking and da 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 da. And then they were going to bring me back the next season as the original character. So when they did the reveal, they put Penny Pizer's face where mine was. And so I, I get I don't know, I guess we're both credited for the same characters. That's crazy. And it was filmed at Warner Brothers, right? Uh, no, we were on Lorimar lot. Oh, okay. Yeah, that yeah. is hilarious. So they I called it Lorimar. But, but actually, it's not too crazy because uh, in terms of the crazy stuff we've heard from people who've been on soaps, like playing two different characters seems pretty normal. <laughs> yeah. like, yes, yes done on, several times. Yes. <laughs> and Betsy Palmer was on. Did you ever come across her? No, she she was. You know what? Let me think. You know what? I I feel like she was in one of the first see the first parts because she played the mother of Joan Van Ark, didn't she, Valine? I, 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 I think I may have crossed with her at one point, like at a big family picnic kind of a thing. I think so, Red Buttons was there. <laughs> By the way, horror fans love these like crazy coincidences when people from the different horror movies within the series happen to cross paths, you know, it's yeah. just great. And we do, it happens, you know, all the time. Like I, I think I don't know if um, maybe it was Lisa Wilcox or Tamara Glenn who've become really good friends of mine. If they did an episode of Not a Lot, Not, I feel like they did did one of them. But yeah, it's funny when that happens. Yeah, that is so that, cool. Lisa Wilcox from Nightmare on Street and Tamara Glenn from Halloween Five. Yes, That's right. So mm-hmm. basically, the three of you together represent the three heavy hitting series. <laughs> That's amazing. And, you know, it's so funny because if you look at all of us we're basically the same person. We look exactly the same. It's so funny. We're sitting at a table having dinner and I'm kind of glancing around and I'm like, we're exactly the same. It's so much fun. (laughs) Do you guys ever fight about whose franchise is better? (laughs) No, half the time we can't remember the franchise we were on. I mean, (laughs) that's amazing. We're just talking, you know, we're usually talking about upcoming stuff we're trying to get and our kids and just life in general. Yeah, those two are, are, are real gems. 
That's yeah, they awesome. look like fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, we're kind of going moving forward into in through your career before we get right into Friday the thirteenth. But so your first foray into horror, well, I guess horror comedy was as Kate in House Two, the second story. And now this um film had quite an eclectic cast, you know, from Ari Gross and John Ratzenberger, Bill Maher. And I'm just asking because it's a really just crazy nuts movie. What were your thoughts when you first read the script? Um. <laughs> Well, you know, first you get that audition invitation, right? And mm-hmm. I loved House One, House, so yeah. much. Oh, yeah. Okay. So much. So I was just like, give me anything. I feel like I filmed that after Friday the 13th, though. Oh, I, oh, think I, oh, I didn't know that because I think well, at least it's credited as coming out before, but ne- it definitely could have. I could I could be wrong. Um, yeah, I, well, no, because I had a I had a a three hundred dollar car that broke down driving to house two, and my manager let me drive his um, Jag. Uh, after Friday thirteenth, I had a car that ran, so I, I'm thinking <laughs> backwards, but I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but I love the house series very much, so I was excited to play her. I mean that that was a and that was a fun series. It it was crazy. My character wasn't involved in all the craziness. So no, it's that's- true. You're kind of more of the like the, a straightforward type of character in a yeah. universe that's so crazy. But it's like it's it's batshit crazy, but like in the best way possible. You know what I mean? <laughs> it is, and you just have to be so grateful to the editors that can make this stuff work because sometimes you're shooting it and you're just like, mm, really okay. <laughs> what well, what was uh, Bill Maher? like to work like was he as smarmy as his character <laughs> not swarmy um but he was uh kind of antagonistic and you know it's that it's that comedy guy and yeah. those com- comedians they're just they're just um kind of an overall negative view of everything and then they just kind of bite everybody but um i i didn't feel anything um ugly from him or anything like that his personality was was what you see just it's younger. so random when he shows up it's it's almost like this person i know from this and they're in this but it also makes sense because you know now i'm sure you know he has his uh, uh late night you know show which is very political and he has that sort of like comedic look at things but sort of pessimistic look and so it sounds like that you know very much it's you know it's funny because everybody in my family we always joke he shows up in this pink tie and it just looks so out of place on him now when we look back. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, well, I remember him from House Two. So right, that- <laughs> me too. The second story. <laughs> you, second okay. Story, yes. So another crazy coincidence, like the Betsy Palmer on Knott's Landing thing, is that. And again, I guess this will depend on which you film first, but Kane Hodder, obviously, who played Jason in Friday the 13th Part 7, is also in House 2. And I guess he was like the stunt quarter. So I have to ask, like, so did you and Kane know each other before Friday the 13th? No, no, because I I wasn't around him for any of the stunts on those days. Because he was dressed as a gorilla. Yeah. Yes, he was a gorilla. I mean, I, I saw the gorilla walking about, you know, in different parts of what gorillas look like but we were never shooting at the same time because our scenes didn't cross over so when we were doing uh friday 13th we were both talking about it i'm like oh wait we, you know it was just kind of surprising I'm like well what were you some gorilla <laughs> that is hilarious it's so funny looking back you're like wait we were both on that movie <laughs> yeah yeah we both did our first autograph signing together at a tiny little comic book store i feel like it was in calabasas somewhere out there and it was just he and I in this little comic store in this little table doing autographs. And we were both, it was like a first time for both of us. Oh, wow. So obviously the movie wasn't called Friday 13th Part 7, The New Blood. It was called Birthday Bash. Can you tell right. us about um, the, what the audition process was like for Tina? Sure. Um, again, it came across as an audition, you know, to just go for Birthday Bash and didn't have a full script, just had the sides, the scenes, as you know, being an actor. And uh, I, I came in very late into casting and I went into a, a small room, a small office, not a creative space. And John Beekler was there and the casting director was there, Anthony Barneo. And they, of course, they're going to give you the most dramatic scenes of screaming and crying and trying to figure things out. And she was a little, you know, loose. Her head was just a little messed up at the time with her mental illness. And it was just very intense looking at everything. And you just got to go with your all. Were your emotions at their peak? <laughs> yes, they were. Yes, they were. It's like, okay, we're going to do a horror scene right here. That's how we do it. But, but they when didn't I got tell the you. callbacks for it, um, uh, 
my, well, we started reading the script at that point and figured out that it was Jason. We figured out this is Friday the 13th and they're trying to just hide it. And I was right. So then I was wait, really excited. Wait, I have to follow up on it. So you're saying when you were first reading, you were just like, oh, wow, I'm in a horror movie and I have telekinesis, but I really don't know what is the scary part of this. Well, I knew, I just knew that there was a, a monster. Oh, got kind. it. Got it. Oh, and wow. Did you, did you go back and watch parts one through six for research or? I didn't have to. I'm a Friday fan. Oh, okay. Oh, so, oh. so you, you had oh. already seen, had you seen a lot of them then already? Yes. yes. I love them. And one and two, my favorites and uh, five and well, you know, I, yeah, I love them. I mean, oh, I, I started. That. When, when did they come out? Was it like um, 81 when they started in there uh, somewhere? 80, 80 was the first one. 81 was the second. And then the third one came out in 82. And then they skipped 83. Okay. And then 84. <laughs> and then 85. And then 86. Six. And skipped then eight, 87. And then, and then yours. yours, 88. Jeez. Wow, y'all are sharp. Uh. Um, <laughs> the first one, I started watching them in the drive-in movies. <gasps> oh, my gosh. We just drive had to go in. to the drive-in. And you're like, that is Betsy Palmer from Knott's Landing. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> my future. <laughs> what? Right? In drive-ins, you know, uh, we would pack all our food and drinks and whatever, and you'd have two scary movies that would go to two in the morning. And and that's how you started watching horror films. First uh, first date I ever had, I went to see Grease. At the I drive-in. love it. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then this one. That is so cool. And and so I'm taking it when you found out that it was a Friday the 13th film, then you must have been excited, right? I just, oh my God, I was so excited. And then, then I was going in for callbacks and I figured it out, but I couldn't like act like I really knew, but they knew I knew because I'm like, I got this. And, um, you know, and then the terror sets in, but then I was brought in, I was given the role and then I was brought in for Kevin and a couple guys to read with me for the love interest. Oh, so I got to read. I think it was two or three of them at that point with them before. They do you do you remember who they were? No, I don't remember their names. No, they were just kind of an all American, good looking. I remember they were blondish, and Kevin was the darkest hair, and he wore this shade of a sweater. I remember that. Oh, and and Lars wearing it's like a purple blue. What? How would you call that color? Color this, just for our listeners. Yeah. In real life, it's just a bright royal blue. Bright, bright royal blue. I obviously don't know anything about colors. No, in real life. I mean, it could look different, right? Well, it looks well, great. We're not going to rub no, it in it, it and looks, tell you what's going on that, here. Yeah, in Los Angeles, it but is we'll a nice. We'll be 70 like, tomorrow. We'll be 70 degrees tomorrow. That's how Texas works. Oh, yeah, wow. Right. So so obviously the role of Tina is very different from the, the many final girls in the series who came yes. before you because Tina has right. telekinetic powers. And I'm just, I'm, I'm sure that added like another level of difficulty onto the role. But I'm wondering, was there any sort of like preparation you did to play someone with this ability? Um, or did, yeah. did John Beekler, was was he very specific about how he wanted you to portray this? Uh, he was in that he didn't want her to come across as, you know, like spastic kind of, boom, having a vision kind of whatever. I think in the original, you know, a lot of his scenes were cut. In the original film, you saw more of Tina's visions of things happening. I wish they had been able to keep some of that because she would see all of the murders more specifically. But um, I did. I, I actually talked to some psychics in L.A. about how they felt a vision coming on. And it was just really to kind of get a feeling of, you know, are, are these psychics for real? Like, you know, I didn't know, but but they didn't know each other and they were saying the same kind of thing. It's not like they were just suddenly embodied by something. It was a feeling that came over and they could kind of stare and see a movie play in front of their mind. And, you know, the whole character, of course, was actually a Carrie type character before yes, I came yeah. in. And they couldn't get all those franchises together. And I'm like, yeah. Compare it to Carrie. Yes, please do. I'll take that. But I also didn't want that to be a feeling that she had that kind of fear and creepy, you know. I wanted her to feel innocent and unsure and that she had been just really abused in so many situations throughout her life. I wanted you to feel that this girl is carrying the world on her shoulders, but she hasn't seen any of the world. You know, she's just seen this tunnel vision of of frightful, scary things in her life. So it was a little different feeling. 
Yeah, no, it's a and, it, and it's it's very because like I was saying, all of the the final girls, I guess, if you use that term, that came before, really, they were just people that were in really unfortunate circumstances. But like for your right. character, you had such a powerful backstory of what happened to her right. dad and her feeling responsible and then having this Dr. Cruz, our horrible doctor. Rose, he was <laughs> So did, did you get like um, migraines or like just the day to day of like the emotions? Were you just exhausted all the time? Yeah, we read on, I think it was IMDb that because of all the crying and stuff that you gave yourself migraines. Is that true? Constant. Yeah. I, oh. I, and I was a migraine kind of person before, still get them once in a while. And yeah, it was a constant migraine, constant, but it was so much fun and worth it and you know you, you shoot out of order as y'all know but some fans may not know watching you shoot out of order and I didn't want her to look like she was just crying through two you know two hours so I had very specific levels of her upsetness and uh, you know would follow my notes but it, it is exhausting more than you think to shoot um, a, a scary movie it is yeah. I mean I uh, us being fans of horror I think it doesn't get enough credit for the amount of emotional yeah. turmoil actors have to oh go gosh. through in these movies right and the energy level that you have to stay at for so long you know mm -hmm. for for over and over and over and, and for so long and and so much emotional energy because you're not seeing stuff happen you know you have to imagine it in these different ways so aside from it just being total fun to do a horror movie and scare everyone and all of that it's still um it's still quite an acting exercise I do have an acting studio and some of our lessons are horror film auditions how and fun is that, that? Is so I want to cool. take that. and we I definitely are going to get to that because I wanted to ask you about the um audition oh, studio that you run now oh. um um because that's so cool one and I think we would all love to have a lesson yes. with you um I um I wanted to ask you about so you're um your love interest in the film, Nick, obviously is played by the stud, Kevin Spiritus, who's a friend of ours. And I know that you two are really close um, now and that you guys are really good friends. But I know, you know, there's all the stuff you read that back then there was some beef between you guys. I was wondering what what was the kind of the conflict between you guys at that point? And was it the denim jacket? <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't stand each other. Really? We could not stand each other. Wow. How come? Just there were just we just couldn't quite find a, you know, I, I there there were a couple of things, Um, you know, his character would come in and out during a certain time. And my character was there consistently, you know, working and sometimes and there was just something about it. We just couldn't connect at all. And, um, uh, but it didn't, it worked. It looked like we were fine. Yeah. yeah. I thought you guys had chemistry. Yeah. yeah. Craziest thing. And then we ended up becoming really dear friends later, many, many years later. So, yeah. No, so like I was saying before, he has nothing but amazing things to say about you. And I know you guys are close and have been involved in each other's lives. So it's so crazy to hear that that's how it started. That's but, a happy ending. But yeah, that is. I mean, I would much rather start ha like conflicting with someone if we're going to end up being really great friends, you know, <laughs> later in life. Man, well, but I'm yeah. Oh, even actually, um, my daughter was Miss Texas junior teen. So my coaching, I also coached the real pageants, not the fake ones and scam ones. And <laughs> she was doing her final competition as Miss Texas. And I got Kevin booked to do the singing because he's an amazing singer to this final production. And that was insane. You know, my daughter's over there. Kevin's over here singing. The audience is swooning. And I'm just like, what the heck? Heck what a full circle I moment. I was just going to say that. You can't no, my oh life. my God. I was just going to say what a full circle <laughs> moment. I swear on my life. That is that's Tim and I have been doing this podcast for too long. Now we say the same <laughs> things. That is really cool. No, but seriously, that is such a sweet and amazing thing to hear. And like I said, like, uh, like uh, the when we've we've known him for a couple years and anytime we've brought you up, which is a lot, it's always how amazing you yeah, are. Yeah, because, you so, know, we. I saw this movie opening day. I begged my brother to see it. I was hiding behind my Skittles box. I was too young. I, I know, I know. <laughs> no, no, but um, um, that is really cool. So, you know, speak, speaking of some of your other cast members, you know, most of your scenes that aren't with Kevin are with um, either Susan Blue, who plays your right. mother, or Terry Kaiser, who plays your psychiatrist, Dr. Cruz. And, but there's a ton of other young cast members who, you know, are spend most of the movie just partying in the other house. And I'm just wondering, did you have a chance 
chance to get close with any of them or what, or did you not get to spend a lot of time with the people who uh, filmed in the other house? Yeah, I, I really didn't spend much time. Uh, we kind of just kept Tina isolated like she was in her own little world. And I worked mostly with Kane and, um, you know, the party scenes and things. I got to talk to them. I mean, I got to know, know them all and hello and whatever, but we didn't really, it wasn't really a carry on kind of relationship going forward. Cause I didn't, you know, they, they shoot the scenes with the group like that. There's not many days of that kind of shooting. So Makes sense, in fact, yeah. I think most of that was done when we were in Alabama and a, a little bit of it with the party group was done in LA, but not many days out of the course of it. Yeah, that makes sense. But speaking of the great Kane Hodder, who we were just mm -hmm. talking about, you know, he has played Jason more times than any other actor. Um, yeah. You know, everyone loves him. But what was he like working with just because you had so many intense scenes with him? And what was he like on set? Like, was he very serious into his character? Was he was he a jokester? Or? I don't remember him being a jokester. He he <laughs> is a jokester. Yeah. He is in life. And I'm a prankster. I like oh. pranks. <laughs> uh, but I'm, you know, he, he was very, very, I mean, he was also in charge of all the safety and the stunts. So, you know, I got to do my first two stunts with him helping me through it, which I'll never do again ever in my career because that's why they have a stunt woman. Wait, and, which, which stunts were these? Because I noticed were, they were so simple, they just made them look dramatic. I did the fall from the stairs into the basement on that yes. big padded. You know, it was a real fall, but the padding, it was. I'd be then, scared. I, yeah, I would too. <laughs> then I did the fall at the end of the pier, you know, face down. That one hurt. I didn't want to do that one again. So. Is that when he picks you up and throws you? That's or... a, He doesn't throw me. That was the stunt double. I just did the oh, okay. fall going towards it at some point. Some, yeah, they were going to throw me off into the lake. I don't think. Um, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Alligator infested lake, by the way. <laughs> right. Alligators, sharks, sky, sky crawl, sharks, sky sharks. <laughs> we're we're going to be coaching. I have a list, a serious list of the film work that I won't do, and I won't work where the bolt where you're in water. I'm not working where things are just dangling around in water. Oh wow! Not interested. Yeah. Not going to do that. You know, those there's some creepy stuff. You got to really read between the lines in those shows. You don't want to. Would you work with tarantulas? No, no, I don't. Okay. <laughs> I just always think about that. <laughs> Tim does not like tarantulas. I used, tarantulas are the <laughs> literally the only thing that scares me. I, um, I have a picture at a fan appearance where someone had an alligator that they walked and a tarantula. And I don't want to talk, talk, talk to it. I don't want to touch it. I don't want to do anything with it. But then I'm like such a perfect opportunity. So um, they, I had them put the tarantula in front of me. And then I acted like I didn't notice that it was there. And I kind of moved my hands around it a little bit, you know, just kind of pretending to myself, I didn't know it was there. So people go, Ooh. That's as, that's as close as I would get. Wow, I would be terrified. I want to see the picture. I know I would be terrified. Yeah, um, just blame that. So I just got to do a quick personal anecdote about my thoughts on one scene in particular in uh, okay. part seven, the scene where Dr. Cruz literally holds your mom in front of him. So Grayson can kill her rather than him. And I don't know if, if because I saw it at a young age or something, but for some reason, that just bothered me so much. And I know it speaks to how despicable his character is, but, and that's why it's so satisfying when he gets killed. But I'm just wondering, mm -hmm. what did you think of that scene? And are there any other the scenes in the movie that you remember like really bothering you or that really stood out to you? Or, or your favorite scene? Yeah. Well, it was really awful using someone as a human shield. <laughs> yes. I think that that kind of got most people. It was just, and, and the mother... Yeah, that was pretty intense. Everybody knows the sleeping bag was insane. And I, I'm a camper. So <laughs> how do you ever camp after that? It's like, you don't, you don't, <laughs> no, you, don't. you don't. So, you know, there were so many horrible things. I wasn't around all of the deaths, so I didn't have to watch them all in person. That's good. Yeah. That's good. But he is, I think it is, you're right. It's like something about it being the mother. Anytime the maternal character is killed. It's just so awful. And poor, yeah. poor Susan Blue was the only one who listened to you. <laughs> she was. Yeah. Uh, you know, an, another crazy thing I read again, this is this like when you, you know, so you never know if anything online is true or not, but it's like that on your off days that you would use a custom button maker to make Jason themed buttons. Well, I, I did what I 
what I did was make, I, I only did it on like a night and a half in Alabama when I was making, I had the buttons made for casting crew gifts and I was engraving them with a little engraving pin. <laughs> Oh my name. God. So, yeah. So, and I did that on Knott's Landing too. I gave everyone oh. special pins I made and special buttons, you know, thing. So do you fun. still have the, the button from that? I do. Yeah. Oh I think God. I have three of them. I think I have three of them. Oh, that is the coolest. One, two, yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, three. Tim and I, we would love, <laughs> what an amazing gift. It's getting a, that is the coolest thing. And by the way, I say, I just want to tell listeners that behind Lar in her bookcase is like a little plush Jason Voorhees. And that is the coolest thing ever. It is so cute. He's got some really creepy eyes. Uh, the director of Roseblood gave him to me. Aww. Oh, Peter, yeah. Peter Anthony. Yeah. And his eyes are like those marble eyes, you know? And I was sitting here at the table, it's kind of the studio room. And I just thought, what if there's a camera in there this whole time. It's been watching me for days. Then my mind started creating a whole thing. And then I had to move him. And then at Christmas, we called him the elf on a shelf. This is Lars. Uh, elf on a shelf. That is hilarious. <laughs> so funny. So when the movie was all done and wrapped, was, um, was there a big red carpet premiere? Or what was that like seeing yourself on, on the big 35 millimeter screen? I don't, I don't remember any... Um, premiere. Uh, it, it played in a couple of places. I went in Westwood and I think I went to Chinese theater uh, at the Chinese. Theater. It was crazy, crazy fun. I wore these big brown glasses. I thought no one would recognize me. And, um, and so it was a little, little strange The the most bizarre thing was driving up sunset or somewhere and seeing the poster. Cause I had gone and shot that half of my face. Oh, how cool. And I didn't really know what they were doing with it at the time. <laughs> I, kind, I mean, they told me it was for marketing, but I didn't, I wasn't putting that together, you know, that they were going to computer kind of graphic that, that face because, you know, um, Tina didn't run from Jason ever. She yeah. didn't run from him. She ran towards him. And um, there's not any scenes. There's one scene where he grabs me by the shoulder. That's it. There's, there's no other scene where he gets close. So sharing the face with him is kind of creepy. I'm but sure. it's also really cool. And what a, what a message of like empowerment, you know, for. Actually, yeah. <laughs> Actually, yeah. I've had people talk to me about, um, you know, I guess I've said horror movies are for fun. You know, they're for fun. But they do have themes that that kind of go through people's lives. And I've had people tell me that that the way the character of Tina kept trying to explain herself and chasing her monsters away is how they had felt in real life with some of their own personal demons. And I'd never heard that before. And I thought, well, that was a really interesting comment from someone watching it, watching a horror movie and then coming out of it with something that actually meant more to them than just fun that evening, you know? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that's why Matt and I watch it over and over. And, and over. that's why I love we love the sequel so much, because like I said, I mean, it just it, it it brought something new to the series in that the the heroine, like I felt like it was the first person who really had a standoff with Jason, you know, because yeah. a lot of the survivors before and not knocking them because they're very powerful um, uh, actors and stars. But it wasn't like Tina, like literally just stood her ground and faced off against him, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And she was so young and didn't have, you know, just her mother to, to believe her. Right. You know, mm -hmm. imagine what the time period was where they put her away. So which so getting to do the sequel 30 years later, crazy what I'd always wanted to do to, you know, give her that next finishing step. Well, and that's what I was going to, so, well, the first thing before we get to Rose, what I was going to ask you is, is that, so I had a few questions about what happened after part seven, because I've, I've read a bunch of things. Like the first thing I read is that John Beekler was going to develop a sequel that continued yeah. Tina's life, like in an insane asylum. And I also read right. that you were working on a screenplay where she was going to work with troubled girls, but then they decided to do Jason takes, takes Manhattan. Manhattan. So what, tell us, <laughs> can you, can you, please, what you can't, what you time, can't see right now is Lars. Putting your hands over yeah, her face. But, but clear it up for us. Because Can you tell us right after it wrapped, what happened and how did it go from that to Jason yeah. Takes Manhattan? <laughs> oh, it was just ridiculous is what it was. So um, they they had a, Paramount had a new line. They would come back usually and ask the final girl back in, but then they'd kill her, right? You know, right in the beginning of the next film. <laughs> so I was like, no, we're not doing that. And um, they came to me and asked me to do part eight but they wouldn't give me a script. And I was like, 
you know, I don't think Tina should die. I really didn't. And they offered me more money than I had ever seen in my life to, to go back. And I sat with my managers and agents and they didn't want me to do it and blah, 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 you know, cause they're whatever. And for years I thought, well, maybe I should have agreed to do it. And I just couldn't say yes to something. I hadn't read any of it and I knew they were going to kill her off. And I just didn't, I didn't trust any of it. So, oh, I so had, they told you, they said, we don't have a script, but yeah, you're going to die. No, they didn't tell me that, oh. but that's what happened to all of the final girls. Oh, yes, yeah. yes. So I didn't know what their script was. Mm -hmm. And John Beekler and I had uh, talked quite a bit about carrying Tina's story forward. And I had started writing the next, next sequel, the part eight myself. And I went into Paramount and I had a pitch meeting with the producers wow. about my little script. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. And then no, thank you. And so I went off to Yugoslavia and shot the Princess Academy in the snow <laughs> <laughs> and they shot part eight in Manhattan. And I'm like, well, had that been part of my part eight? I'm really glad I didn't go do this. And <laughs> that's where it went. That was exactly wow. what happened. I had no idea because I, I figured that's the thing it is. And I, I do agree with you. Like nothing irks me more than the beginning of part two when they kill off Alice, who was the, uh, you know, the, the final survivor from part one. Because what a lot of these studios don't know is that the fans and the the audience you have gone through such an ordeal with this person and they survive so you don't want them to just die yeah. and, no, and just i think that, yeah and i think that's why people like soaps and friday 13 so much because they're very similar but <laughs> the continuity you know yeah, the studios because, are terrible <laughs> people, people want to follow a story especially if you're going back for a sequel it's usually because the characters in the story are something you want to watch continue, not right. completely change. Exactly. Um, so, you know, I was, I was glad about that. And recently I actually found in a box of the stuff, the original handwritten script that I did for the next episode, handwritten with the typed version that I took into Paramount. And I was, I was just so shocked. And I'm like, oh, I didn't look at all of it. I glanced and then I just put it away. I wasn't ready to, to look at that whole Can plot. you tell us like yeah. elevator pitch, like what the plot would have been? Sure, sure. I wanted her to end up in a mental institution and uh, to have gotten involved with the love interest and for them to have been divorced. And I wanted Tina to go into psychiatry and helping people that had mental issues. And it was just kind of an, uh, it was just, it was a way to bring back the uh, original actors playing parents and then the kids coming in playing you know to cross the ages over for the series and mm -hmm. i just got well that's very interesting thank you <laughs> thank you uh manhattan <laughs> <laughs> you go to manhattan you go to yugoslavia oh wow uh, so yeah. okay so now we flash forward 33 years from 1988 to 2021 and you are reprising the character of tina shepherd in peter anthony's film roseblood alongside your co-stars terry kaiser and kevin spiritus now we were lucky enough to have peter and kevin on the podcast last year but we'd love to hear about more about the project from you and by the way i just want to let listeners know you can catch or you can watch roseblood for free on youtube you just have to search peter Anthony Productions. It's his page and the film is on that page. So I definitely advise um, going to that page so you can watch this film. But how did how did playing Tina come about after all this time? Yeah, you know, it had been a dream the whole time. And John Beekler and I had talked about how we wanted to take her in a direction. It just never was going to just there just wasn't a way to make it happen. And one day I get a call from this guy, Peter, who's, you know, a fan and he's written this script. Da, da, da. I'm just in my kitchen putting dinner together and I'm listening to him. He doesn't sound too crazy. He's a little intense, but he didn't sound like a crazy fan. <laughs> and, and then he said, Oh, I met you at a convention and I have a picture of us together. I'm like, okay, crazy fan. <laughs> you're like you, you and 5,000 other people. But right. yeah. yeah. And he texts it to me. Oh, you're like, like hey. I, I don't remember it. I'm like, mm -hmm, yeah. And <laughs> so he sends me a script and I read it and it was very good. I mean, he's actually he's real good. And I gave him I said some suggestions. He said, well, just have you do a little cameo. And I'm like, well, if you're going to get me in the film, why don't you just give me lines and we'll change the story. <laughs> and he went back and he did all this. He's so good. Like he's this little jewel in the, in our industry. And then I said, well, let me talk to Kevin. Maybe Kevin would come back as, as that. And I'm like, let me call Terry who lives in, you know, Colorado in the middle of nowhere, Terry. Oh my God, he's crazy. And that's how it started. 
And then we wow. just all did it. And we all went to his premiere together up in um, Connecticut and had a blast. We were so I excited. was just about to ask yeah. you, why didn't you call Season Blue? But then I oh, remember yeah, she, she died. Well, what, what, well, no, but I, <laughs> Terry but Terry, died. Terry died Terry. too. Oh, so that's true. He did. Was it, was it Peter's idea or your idea to have him like as an apparition or together? Did you guys decide the that? Way that he, the way that he wrote him in was all 100% Peter. It was just wow. my idea of, you know, I could call Terry just kind of as a, a thought. Uh, no, Peter was responsible for all of the all of the script. And I loved it. I loved how he put him in her head because he's that's what would happen. He would just kind of stay in her head for years being tormented in the mental institutions. So. What, what was it like um, working with them again? Like right when they said action, were you just like, wow, this is another full circle moment. Yeah, I know. Full circle. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it was because Peter actually found all of the things from the, the late eighties that he was putting in the room and Tina was imagining them all appearing on the table. And um, we had so much fun. We did a few takes of it, just a couple of ways. We had a blast shooting it. And at first, the crew and everybody after we did the first scene they were totally quiet like he called cut or something and nobody moved nobody made a sound and terry and i looked at each other like did we really mess that up and then they they had enjoyed watching it from so far back they were like oh we didn't know what to do so, they were probably starstruck you know I it's mean, like we were when we heard yeah. about this we were so 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 excited like and talking to peter and and kevin it was so much fun we had had kevin on the podcast before but he told us about peter and this great idea and we were so excited and peter was like the sweetest guy he was so nice and so, so supportive and just a really all-around great he works guy. out yes very good looking guy, <laughs> good looking guy. No, but, you know. but i mean he's just like a fans fan and as yeah. fans how many times can i say fans we love talking to him but um you know one new addition to your character that we as as fans notice is that notice that um you know the tina in this movie when she's using her telekinesis now she extends her hand and i was wondering was that something you kind of were looking at as like an evolution of your abilities yes yes and um um she yeah she did it in a couple of places and it's because we had one part of the film that did not end up getting its full story in in Roseblood and that's that Tina had been given one of the injections that they were giving some of the people and my veins all turned black oh and so originally I was trying to see how do we show these veins have gone black and that Tina's fighting both good and bad because she uses her powers against people just you know, just if they're bothering her, she sees them bothering someone else. <laughs> and I was hoping to get the veins in <laughs> more. Well, speaking of more, because I, um, well, we, we do spoilers all the time, so it doesn't matter. But Roseblood ends with, you know, Nick, Kevin Spiritus arrives after you've defeated Jason for the moment. And we can only assume, I think he takes you out of Camp Crystal Lake research facility. So <laughs> it sets things perfectly up for a sequel with the two of you on the run. And I'm just wondering, has Peter talked to you yet about a sequel? Would you be up for doing it? Please say yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We, we, we are, we're in the middle of talking about it now. He's still doing so much publicity and stuff on, you know, Roseblood, but that's, uh, that's definitely something that we want to do. Um, he's, got to figure out some things with the legalities of the studios and what they own and don't own so you know a name might change a little bit or have an addition something it might have to take it a little bit away and you know I think with the young girl playing Rose was fabulous and the girl that played me in the, in the flashback was excellent yeah. I think the three of us could almost trio a little um, franchise I mean, oh. no, that'd be great. We, I mean, it was, was, it was, we had, after we watched, I, I texted Peter and because he was, it wanted to know what we thought. And I was like, the first thing I was like, is okay, you got to have a sequel because like you, you, because it's perfect because Laura and Kevin are there and uh, I want to see what they do and next. Kissing. Yes. <laughs> and kissing. Shoot them all. They're still alive, Peter. Don't be a fool. <laughs> so, you know, 2021 was a big year in horror for you because not only I know we're focusing on Rosebud, but you also played yourself alongside a ton of other Friday the 13th stars in 13 Fanboy, right. um, a film that was directed by part five star Deborah Voorhees, who we also were lucky enough to yeah. have on the podcast. So we were wondering, how, do, how did you get involved in that project and what was it like working with so many Friday the 13th alums? 
Well, it was, it was just kind of one of those surreal things. Deborah's just very, very friendly and down to earth and called me and we talked a little bit about what the character could be doing. And she was taking on such a huge, you know, she was taking on this huge project with all of us actors and her shooting schedule was in the summer and in the winter it stopped like right before COVID hit the beginning. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, she was going around everyone's schedules. Crazy. But I really liked the idea. I had had a, a stalker personally in my life for many years. You just oh, wow. deal, you know, they're, they're, they can be very violent and crazy, which I dealt with. And I just liked the idea that uh, and I talked with Deborah. I didn't want the, the pseudo character of Lar to die. And as you see, I don't in that yeah. film either because I didn't want the idea of Tina to die. <laughs> and uh, she's like, cool. So then I'm having fun with this idea. And, and I love doing it. Shot it in New Mexico. And uh, Deborah was really a very good director. She let me just really work, work through some of the, you know, he locks her in a basement and leaves her there for eternity or whatever <laughs> happens. We don't know. So that was very cool. A lot it of fun. A, yeah, it is creepy. And Deborah told us about because she had like stalking um, 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 experiences too. And I know Adrian King had stalking experience. So I, it was something like when we talked with her about the film, it was like, it was almost it was almost like it's something that felt really realistic. Yeah. And I think that's what makes it so terrifying. Yeah, it's terrifying. <laughs> yeah, terrifying. Because, you know, they're obviously mentally ill at that stage if they're stalking and, and whatever and fixated on something. Uh, not to mean that it's easy to, easier to deal with, but, you know, sometimes you're going to deal with that. Yeah. Um, did you ever think filming Friday 13 Part 7 that you'd be talking about it uh, 34 years later? No. <laughs> no wouldn't have thought that no wouldn't have thought i'd bring the character back 30 years later either no yeah um, how crazy yeah. is that you know but that's that speaks to the fandom and we when we talk to a lot of people from movies from you know 20 30 40 years ago that they thought at the time they were just you know doing a job doing a project and then the fandom yeah. has lasted and it's not it just, just lasting it's like you're reprising these roles you know it's just crazy you know and and i loved this series so much that for me it was just i was thrilled to do it and it hoped the part eight would have continued and it didn't but i always had in my mind i was always hoping that we could do something with tina and, um, you know, so that was, it was actually a really special whole project. I mean, Kevin and Terry and I were just like, this is just amazing. This yeah, is just it just does not really, it doesn't happen often. And I'm so no. glad that it happened. And I also wanted to ask you, cause you mentioned earlier, you gone to a horror convention. I've gone to horror conventions, but I have not seen you. Cause I <laughs> guess our paths have not crossed, but, but now when we see you, we yeah. are coming up to say hi, of course, Please without do. tarantulas though. Yeah. No tarantulas. But no I wanted tarantulas. to ask you. Um, what is the one thing that fans always come up to you and do like ask you to write a certain line? Yeah, like or... what's the most common question? <laughs> Was I scared working with <laughs> working with Jason? You know, I'm like, no, I sat next to him at lunch. The latex really stank. I wasn't I wasn't scared working <laughs> with Jason. That, that's the one I get the most. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. And they do want me to write, you know, I'll, I'll write bad news cruise a lot. <laughs> <laughs> on uh, the products and things that's always fun but you know normally they're just really friendly mm -hmm. and can you imagine you know as an actor getting to have some audience member fan come up to you and say thanks I had fun you gave me I'm always saying this in my studio too we do have a little noble profession. It seems wacky and crazy and all of this, but people watch things and people watch entertainment and we, whatever our entertainment is, they get something from it. It releases some of their day or they have some fun and laugh. So, you know, that's, that's what the conventions have meant to me, kind of getting to know people that are really enjoying your work right yeah. and 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 just so you know like as fans the conventions mean so much to us because oh. we get to i mean it just being able to talk with you now is such a high moment in yeah. like our lives it really is 22 2022 is, is done we're well, done because really okay. because when we watch <laughs> we grow up with these movies these these movies are really important to us and then talking to the people that portray these characters that we love is just such a great experience so like we definitely can identify with these fans who are just so enamored at these conventions you know? well I go fangirl I'll be at the conventions and see someone 
you know, that I'm over the moon for. And so, you know, that's so exciting. Yeah, yeah. I get it. Yeah, I totally understand it. I, I wanted to also ask you about because you um you opened, I think it is it's actor audition studios, correct? Yes, actors audition studios. Actors audition studios. Yes. And so you act as um an audition coach and and coach for people who are going on auditions and things like that. I'd love for you to tell us more about that and how you got involved in that. Well, I, I was coaching for a long time and uh, then I just it just seemed that I needed to go ahead and go studio wise, but um, I'm a, a mentor coach, so um, I don't work with the actors doing it as a hobby. I'm only working with those that are in the profession or trying to get in the profession, or they may be some people that's careers have their careers have stalled for some reason, and we need to reignite them. Mm -hmm. So I, I create their marketing campaign and all of that. So um, I've had it a long time, and I just love it. I wrote a book called Get Started, Not Scammed. Oh, nice. So many scams and they make oh, me crazy. I experienced one in Ohio. I oh yeah. Good what times. Was it? Yeah. Was it come to the weekend? Oh no, it was oh no, no. It was like it was called uh, Z models. Because they know I'm a model. <laughs> they knew it just from that second, yes, that you were gonna be right. Well, they, they they're like, we need a thousand dollars for pictures, blah blah blah. Oh. But I'm sure you teach like that's garbage. <laughs> You're like, first lesson, don't fall for that shit. Yeah. <laughs> And the thing is, what's so hard is there's such a fine line between teaching a creative art and a scam because, yes, you have to have pictures and, yes, they're going to cost and you're going to go and, yes, you have to have training. Da, da, da. It's, you're opening a business. Uh, so and the scams can make it seem so real. And I'm always teaching them, that, you know, get a radio show. Disney's coming to Winnipeg. And I'm like, they're not. They're not going to where these cities are looking for the next. They're just not, they just walk down their street and they've got thousands of them. They're, they're not coming to get you. They're not. So I have to, I, I really, I speak on that actually quite a bit. So that, that's why I wrote the book. Um, and the scams are, they're slick. I mean, they, they prey on your vulnerabilities. You know, you want to be in the business. You want to be an artist, you want to be an actor so badly. And, and um, they they get a lot of people and, it, you know, you just aren't going to get your money back. That's for sure. Yeah. Wow. If, you know, and there are good programs that may cost a thousand or something, but you're being trained by someone or, or these people are coming in and doing these amazing, really good programs. They're solid as they can be. And the scams kind of mirror that. So you don't sometimes you don't know what's real and what's not. And it's the way that it's presented to you is how you have to know if it's real or not. Yeah, I, I think paying for like a class or something like that, you're getting something out of it. Mm -hmm. But you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, but they do prey on young people's uh, vulnerabilities. Yeah. And they do it during the holidays and special. They really do it when schools are out and the kids are out and about. The teens are at Six Flags or at their mall or it's something like that. And they approach them with the business card kind of a thing. That's the first uh, way they get them. And then, you know, bring your mom in or bring your dad in. Yeah, it's quite a quite a process. Yeah, I think things are changing, though. I think people are, people are getting yeah. wising up a little, yeah. but Thank at the you. same time, as, as people wise up, I feel like these scam artists will come up with new scams. Right, right, right. <laughs> I don't think they're wising up at all. Oh, oh really? really? <laughs> no, mm -mm. no. I would love to say that they are. Yeah. I think but... I am. <laughs> <laughs> because you've been through it. Exactly. I'm 44. I'm not 14. <laughs> Right? They get the 44 year olds too. I know. They, yeah. That's they get them all. And the thing is, the reason I don't think it's changing is because the acting and modeling is such a dream. And you, sometimes you don't want anyone to know it's your dream. You know, maybe you don't, maybe you're, the possibilities for that person aren't really there. And they, they get in front of this person that just knows exactly how to prey on them. And instead of, you know, like when I work with, with someone and have a, their initial consultation, I'll say, you're not, you're not ready right now to work with me. You need to go take a few of these classes. Here's some that fit you right now. You know, you don't need a mentor career coach right now. You need some basics, but. Yeah. Do you ever have people that sign up, but really they just want to like talk and hang out with you because they love Friday the 13th? Like, Part seven. Like, I got I'm Tina. I, I know. Is it Eddie? You do? <laughs> it's Matt and Tim. <laughs> yeah. I can usually catch that pretty quick in a consult and shut that down. And, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty friendly, pretty down to earth person. So sometimes they'll get a little frozen and then, then, then everybody's fine. Just yeah. Like, well, uh, for listeners, please check out um, the URL is www.actors, 
um, plural, Audition Studios, all one word, actorsauditionstudios.com. Because I can tell you, I, if I were pursuing acting profession, I want to be coached by Lar Park Lincoln. Me too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, well um, Lar, we have one final question that we ask everyone um, in all of our interviews. And I just have to say, before we even ask this, this has been so much fun. Yes, like you. literally like yeah. such a high point of oh my gosh. the day, the week, I'm, the year. I'm just so excited we were able to get it, you know, get together and get it happening. Yeah. Oh, yes. So much. It's been our pleasure. And we wanted to ask you, and it may put you on the spot a little bit, but we'll give you some time to think. We wanted to ask you, what is one thing that you can tell us about your experience working on Friday the 13th Part 7, The New Blood, that you've never told any other interviewer, publication, podcaster, convention, just one thing that you've never Kevin. told. That you've never told. Kevin. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> or one thing that you've never told in any interview or, or at any convention that you can tell us about your experience working on that film. And it can oh. be anything. The littlest thing, big gossip something about. or it could be so minute yeah anything 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 lar anything <laughs> take a minute <laughs> we'll start the clock yeah yeah no. No. <laughs> oh gosh um anything about working on the film that someone wouldn't know did someone like streak the set <laughs> <laughs> I don't and know. off-screen romances that no one talked about. <laughs> I never heard of any. Nobody tells me anything. I didn't know any of the stuff going on anywhere. You were too um, busy having headaches from all your crying. <laughs> I was. I know one thing. Somebody may have talked about it. We were in Alabama filming, and we had we uh, several of us actors. Like there were like five of us, I guess, went into a town to have dinner or whatnot. And when we came back, there was a storm that started coming through a really bad storm and we were crossing one of those real low lying roads and the water was getting up to the window of the car. Uh, and I remember at that moment, I thought, well, this is really when it's done. I mean, this is it. And the, the water was there. And a few of us were talking about how do we get out? And uh, we had on, we had uh, like some hiking boots. Some of us had some water kind of boot things on. And I said, I think we should just swim. You know, it was like, I didn't know what to, we were all in that car and it would have, it would have taken all of us out. And then suddenly we just kind of started coming up a little bit and it receded a little bit. And that was one of the most terrifying things in my life um, ever. You know, you think car, uh, some water will get on your wheels, but not to where you're like, okay, it's a flash. Oh my right? God. That, yeah. first off, that's a great that's story. A great story. That, that is terrifying. Yeah. You were the guy that played um, Larry, the very um, conservative the one in the film. Yeah. yeah. He's cutie, cutie. He, he was in the car. Yeah. And um, I don't, Kevin wasn't in the car. Uh, I, I'm not sure who the girls were. There were about five of us. Yeah. And you were literally thinking, oh my God, this is it. We are going to be drowning in this car. Yeah. Yeah. I was in the front seat and I was like, yeah. And, end of it all right now <laughs> the oh. end the end <laughs> wow i had but, i've, know, never I've heard always that. told no. my kids i have a, a a it's not a joke but my children always say mom quit talking about when you're when you're done when you're over and because i i've always told them so many funny things and i said however i die however it is i want you to make up a really dramatic story <laughs> and tell everyone kind of privately a different story so it will go on and it will be oh she was this and she just unless it's like a plane and they could figure it out tell all these different stories and just make it really dramatic right oh and then do god. a monologue oh my god well we have it right here okay so what happened was and then as the water was seeping in lar yes. like punched through the, the window and <laughs> started swimming to the and an camp. alligator came yes. two alligators <laughs> an alligator came and bit her but she <laughs> still got <laughs> with no legs with no legs she <laughs> slipped there it is see can we just tell the story laura is that okay that's it. i love it i love it that's perfect so yeah <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, that is an incredible. That is terrifying. Wow. I would be terrified. terrifying. Terrifying. Wow. I've been driving during a flash flood. It is a. I'm not a good driver to begin with, and b. <laughs> That's true. How am I supposed to drive when there's always rain? That yeah, no, that is scary. I have always thought about things like that when you hear about flooding in different areas and people right. that do get stuck in their cars, and that's terrifying. It really. I is. know, and this was like in the lake ocean, whatever we were crossing, the lake ocean, the, the lake ocean. <laughs> yeah, and it was. <laughs> 
it was one of those where there's not the railings, you know, it's just across the road. Yeah. Wow. Um, that was, well, we're so cool. glad you survived. Yes, we are very glad. <laughs> Tina wasn't going down in that water. <laughs> Tina was not. Yeah. No, well, thank no. you, Laura. We've again, like I said, we've had such a fun time with you. You are such yeah. a bright, shining light. Yeah, just a like breath of fresh, like just a breath of fresh air. And we've had so much fun talking with you. We're big fans. We are so, so many of our friends were talking about how much they love this movie and so excited we were talking with you. So thank you so much. Yeah. That's, that's very kind. Thank you very much. Very much. I yeah. appreciate it. Okay, well, we'll definitely be in touch. And thank you so much. Enjoy the yes. rest of your day. Happy thank Saturday. You okay, Bye. take care. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Happy Horror Time. This podcast is hosted by Matt Emmer and myself, Tim Murdoch, and co-produced and edited by Jacob Randall. We now release episodes every Monday, and in each episode, we either review horror movies that just came out or interview stars and insiders from iconic horror films. You can stream all our episodes directly from our website, that's happyhorrortime.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And remember... Our reviews do contain spoilers, so we always post the movies we're discussing a few days in advance on our social media pages so listeners can check them out ahead of time. And speaking of social media, make sure you follow our pages on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Happy Horror Time. We even started putting our interviews up on YouTube along with our horror short film, Come In. You've got to check it out. You can find us on YouTube by searching for Happy Horror Time. If you'd like to support the podcast, please sign up to be a patron at patreon.com slash happy horror time. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash happy horror time. Patrons get access to our growing library of monthly bonus episodes and other fun benefits like ad-free episodes that are out a day in advance, our monthly newsletter, participation in polls, and autographed Happy Horror Time stickers! Woo! And if you'd like to contact us, please send us an email at happyhorrortime at gmail.com. Tell us what you love, how sexy you think we are, whatever! I'm Matt Emmer. And I'm Tim Murdoch. And, and we, we hope, hope you have, have a happy, happy horror time! time.